Good morning, everyone. Uh, the, it is 10 sharp, so it's uh, about time to start with uh, our webinar. Uh, welcome to our webinar about working in Norway. My name is uh, Vlora Hajimamedi. I am one of the uh, 30 lawyers in Magnus Legal, uh, and uh, together with uh, two of my other colleagues, Martin and uh, Eric, we will be guiding you through some of the general topics um, uh, in relation to working in Norway. Um, the webinar will last for about an hour, so it will be quite tactical, uh, but if you don't manage to uh, um, to uh, uh, get with you everything, then don't worry. We will be sending the uh, presentations to you uh, through uh, email um, after this webinar. And if you should have any questions, uh, please feel free to uh, ask them during the webinar. You can do so by uh, writing your questions in the uh, chat field uh, and uh, we will try to respond to them at the end of the webinar. If we should not have time enough at the end of the webinar to answer all your questions, please leave your uh, telephone number and also email address so that we can contact you afterwards. Uh, I will be showing you some of my uh, slides and they will be um, about um, entering Norway and some of the general principles on immigration and uh, COVID-19 restrictions. And uh, after uh, my presentation, you will be guided through the uh, compliance um, um, le legislations with uh, uh, my colleague Martin Wikbot. And last but not least, Erik Engislan will take you through some of the general principles related to employment law. So uh, when entering Norway, what is important to know, first of all, is that there are quite a lot of immigration rules for work purposes, so we will be uh, focusing our presentations on work uh, purposes, not other purposes, uh, at least in this webinar. Uh, we will uh, also go through some of the uh, most relevant COVID-19 restrictions uh, with regards to especially testing and uh, quarantine. Uh, Immigration. Uh, Nordic citizens um, are uh, free to reside and start working in Norway from day one. So uh, there are no um, uh, requirements with regards to uh, registrations or residence permit, uh, at least not as it is for EU and EA citizens who also or who would need to uh, register at the police station if they intend to stay for more than three months continuously. And then we have all other residents, as, uh, which we call third country residents or citizens. And uh, in principle, um, third country citizens may not start working in Norway before they have a residence permit in place. Uh, third country residents, however, may um, be in situations where they have a, an employer, uh, an EEA or EU employer, uh, and hold a permit in such country. Uh, in that case, they might be uh, treated the same as um, other uh, EU or EA citizens. Um, there are uh, some exemptions to um, third country citizens uh, situations not needing to apply for a residence permit. It will depend on the type of work. It will also depend on the uh, duration in many cases. I will not um, mention all cases uh, of exemptions. Um, I will only mention a few of them uh, very, very briefly uh, that we have uh, had uh, more experience with with and it is especially 
technical experts uh, for use of machinery or technical equipment. Uh, for example, uh, in relation to devices, uh, IT equipment and so on. Um, and uh, as long as they are, um, um, are working in Norway for up to three months. Um, also, some offshore workers might be exempted from permit, uh, from applying for a permit. Uh, and uh, those are um, offshore workers uh, on either Norwegian or foreign mobile installations on the Norwegian continental shelf. Um, as mentioned, I will not go into the details in, um, in this respect. Uh, third country citizens, um, well, uh, normally we uh, look at especially two main types of permits, and those are skilled workers with an employer in Norway. And we also have workers assigned by an international company to a branch in Norway. And uh, you also need to be aware that there are uh, several requirements, uh, such as having an offer of employment. Uh, there are requirements to competence, for example, education uh, or um, vocational training uh, or uh, longer relevant work experience. And um, there are also um, conditions or requirements in relations uh, to pay and working conditions. Uh, again, I will not go into the details, but if you should have questions, of course, you will be free to uh, to ask them during the webinar during the webinar and uh, also by leaving uh, your email uh, at the end. Uh, other considerations to have in mind is that if a third country citizen uh, with a permit in Norway is laid off or lose, um, lose their job, um, they will not necessarily have to leave the country. As long as they have a valid permit, they can stay in Norway. Uh, and um, especially uh, when laid off, uh, either partially or in full. And if you lose your job, uh, you might stay in Norway up to six months uh, to um, search for a new job. Uh, very brief about Brexit because it has effective, uh, affected British citizens in quite a lot of ways and one of them is definitely immigration because um, as of one uh, first of December, first of January 2021, uh, they will not be regarded as uh, EU EEA citizens, they will be treated as um, uh, third country citizens. However, uh, those having uh, arrived in uh, Norway before 31st of December 2020 and having a right to stay in Norway, um, if they are employed by a Norwegian company, they will maintain resident in Norway from 1st of January, but they will need to apply for a new residence permit. Uh, if uh, British citizens are employed in a foreign company and sent to an assignment to Norway, uh, they must have a valid residence permit to work in Norway from 1st of January. So just this to have in mind. And again, as mentioned previously, uh, if a British citizen um, has a um, uh, has an employment in, in, in an EU or EA company and holds a residence permit in such a country, uh, they will be treated as an EU or EA citizen. So very important to to have to keep that in mind um, coming from a third country or um, now also um, uh, UK. There are some rules related to job seekers as well. Uh, they will be allowed to stay in Norway for up to six months as uh, a job seeker with some requirements to uh, both competence, uh, sufficient funding and also um, uh, submission of form or registration as a job seeker. If you are a British citizen having moved to Norway after 31st of December, unfortunately, you must follow third country citizens regulations. And then over to some general uh, rules uh, about COVID-19 restrictions because Norway has become one of the most uh, or one of the countries with um, the strictest um, uh, regulations or restrictions. 
um, and which is very necessary for foreign employees, especially to be aware of. There have been a lot of changes uh, throughout the way, so it's been a lot of confusion as well. So hopefully we will um, uh, at least try and aim to um, uh, clarify some of uh, the restrictions. Uh, Norway, uh, especially or in particular, um, uh, have restrictions to travelers from red countries and uh, they are applicable to uh, both prior to arrival in Norway and after arrival. So as you see, I have um, inserted a map and the red countries are uh, countries uh, with restrictions, but also uh, the striped or grey ones will be uh, in the same group. Uh, first of all, prior to arrival, everyone must register uh, by filling in a travel registration form. Uh, and uh, there are currently no exemptions, so also Norwegian residents or anyone holding a permit in Norway already must register. Uh, and uh, as far as we have understood, uh, the registration shall be done within 72 hours prior to arrival. It should be done electronically. So if uh, if you fail to do so, you might actually risk to end up with fines just to have that in mind as well. Prior to arrival, there are also requirements to testing. So before you arrive, you have to make sure that you can present a certificate of a negative COVID test and it should be taken no earlier than 24 hours prior to arrival in Norway. Or if you come by plane, uh, 24 hours prior to departure of the first flight leg. So um, um, regardless of whether uh, you would have to change flights, flights or, or not. Uh, and um, again, if you should um, uh, not have such a test, the authorities might actually have a competence to refuse entry or also uh, impose fines. There are some exemptions. So if you are one of those uh, already um, having had uh, COVID-19 like myself uh, and uh, you uh, uh, have such a certificate, um, um, you can actually be exempt from testing after arrival to Norway um, if uh, you have had COVID-4 during the last six months. Um, unfortunately, per date, there are no exemptions for people having been vaccinated. It might change in the future. We don't know that yet. Again, um, it's not sufficient with testing before coming to Norway. After you come to Norway at the border, you also need to, um, uh, to test uh, for COVID-19. And uh, you can test um, or you should test, especially if you have been in a red country the last 14 days before arrival. <coughs> Sorry, uh, this includes nationals, uh, Norwegian nationals as well. Uh, per date, I am not uh, informed that um, people haven't ha having had COVID is uh, are excluded. Uh, I myself had to be tested regardless of that. So you should be uh, aware of that because there are fines in this case as well. So um, when arriving Norway, uh, in addition to um, having a test at the border, if the test is a rapid test, you also need to have a PCR test if you come from one of the countries uh, mentioned uh, in the presentation, uh, i.e. UK, South Africa, Ireland, Netherlands, Austria, Portugal and Brazil. Um, then we also have requirements with regards to quarantine because everyone coming from a red country, which as you saw in practical, it means more or less every single country um, with the exception of some um, yellow uh, areas in Finland, uh, amongst others. Um, if you come from a red country, you are obliged to hold a quarantine for 10 days. It is also applicable to non-EU or EEA country citizens, just to have that in mind. You might be released earlier um, after seven days, but as mentioned, you need to test negative 24 hours prior to arrival or departure. Uh, you also, uh, well, the rules say that you also need to be tested negative um, 
than three days after arrival, but since they have now um, uh, requested that all uh, that everyone tests at arrival at the border, then this test will be sufficient in addition to a test or, or a negative test earliest seven days after arrival. And uh, when you test um, the seventh day after arrival, uh, you need to know that it is not sufficient with a rapid test. You specifically need to have a PCR test um, uh, because it is a more thorough test. Um, Again, um, with regards to uh, quarantine, although there is an obligation to, to test when arriving the border, you will not have a quarantine requirement if you have had COVID-19. Um, also in this case, vaccination, vaccination does not release from quarantine. There are other exemptions as well, but I will not be going into uh, those exemptions here because um, uh, we have uh, limited it to especially uh, well, some cases, some more relevant cases. Um, when, uh, well, with a quarantine requirement also comes a uh, requirement uh, of a place of stay. So in principle, everyone should um, be in quarantine in a hotel, which is provided by the municipality. Uh, there are some exemptions um, and one of them is if you own or rent a residence in Norway, so this must be documented, but if you do manage to document it either through a, um, uh, for example, rental contract or a contract or uh, other uh, um, uh, or a certificate of residence, for example, then um, you might be able to do uh, the uh, quarantine period in um, in uh, own or rented residence. Uh, for employers, it is um, especially important to know that they may uh, provide um, a uh, suitable place for um, their uh, for their employees where they can hold the uh, quarantine. They need to be aware that the um, authorities, the labor inspection authorities, have become very strict uh, in um, uh, the controls they make. So they have uh, put in quite a lot of resources in. Um, uh, in in um, sort of audits uh, where they go to workplaces and see whether the requirements are held or not. Um, so what you need to keep in mind is that you need to um, uh, have the employee in a place where it is possible to keep distance from others. That means uh, own room with TV and internet, own bathroom, own kitchen or food delivery. Uh, and this must also be documented, so um, a confirmation from an employer is sufficient and uh, the government has uh, published a link of a form, uh, which you also see in my presentation here, uh, or that you um, as an employer can uh, fill out and hand over to the employee to, to bring with. Uh, last, um, if uh, anyone should break the quarantine, um, quarantine requirements, please note that uh, the authorities have uh, competence to um, uh, expel you or to uh, impose fines. So that was all from my side. Again, if you should have uh, questions, please feel free to ask them in the chat box or uh, and also leave your uh, phone number or email address so I may contact you afterwards. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, I am now giving the word to my colleague Martin Wigborg, uh, who will be guiding you through uh, compliance uh, issues. Thank you. Martin, over to you. Yeah. Thank you, Laura. This was indeed interesting. And uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Martin Wickborg. I'm a lawyer with Magnus Legal, and I've been working for more than 25 years with international clients. My presentation today will be about uh, compliance issues when working in Norway. And I'll share your, the presentation with you. I presume you have it there. Yes, Martin. Very good. Now, the issue is that when you do business or work in Norway, you need to be compliant with respect to proper registration and reporting, as well as obedient to the tax and social security legislation. And why is this important? Well, firstly, your Norwegian client expects that you comply. 
And you should note that in certain cases, uh, the client may be entitled to terminate the contract if you are non-compliant. And secondly, you are exposed to heavy penalties and fines for non-compliance. So it's actually must to be compliant in Norway if you intend to do be taken serious seriously as a business uh, player. Compliance rules are relevant for both the employer and the employee, and therefore I have divided my presentation in two parts. However, first I like to go through the registration tool that you need to know when you are doing business or work in Norway. That is called Altin, and it's the, the website for public authorities. This is how you communicate with authorities. Um, you will find that basically most of your communication must go through this web portal Altin. This is done when you register, for instance, a company. Uh, this is done when you report, uh, file applications, you file the returns, and you send or see messages from various authorities. How to enter uh, Altin is that, well, you need access. And first of all, the person uh, that entering need to have the Norwegian ID number. Uh, the person needs to have access codes. There are various forms for access codes. One is the bank ID code device. And you need a registered role with the company or a delegated role from the person you are representing. We experienced that foreign clients might find Altin quite problematic, at least in the beginning. And therefore, the Magnus legal lawyer are frequently appointed as a contact person or a business manager for foreign entities or a delegated role from, from individuals that needs to enter Altin. Now, my first part will be to focusing on certain compliance issues relevant for the foreign employer, which in this case is a non-Norwegian company. And the first issue is that the employer must be registered in Norway. This is called a NUF in Norway. Um, or a branch, the NUF is actually nothing else than a foreign entity that has been registered in Norway. First, there are various registering in registers in Norway, and they're all located at Brønnesund. That's what we call, we are called Brønnesund register. The first or the umbrella, umbrella register is called the Central Coordinating Register for Legal Entities. Um, and when the company register here, it will achieve a Norwegian organization number. And this number is used in all communications with authorities and with business partners. And for instance, it's a must to include the, the Norwegian org number at the invoice. Under the, that register, there's the register for business enterprises, where all foreign or all businesses that do has business activities in Norway are supposed to register. Uh, there is defined business activities is defined as if you your company is working now for more than 90 days or if your turnover exceeds not 50,000, which normally would be in, in quite a less days than the, the 30, 90 days. There are also other registers if you have employees as the title of this seminar uh, is aiming at, then you need to register at the employee register. There's a VAT register, separate register. And the question, do we have a tax register in Norway? And the answer is actually no. Uh, but it's so that the tax authorities, they have access to the other registers. And they expect that if a foreign entity registered in Norway via the register of business enterprises or the central coordinating register for legal entities, the company should file the tax returns, and if they do not, they will come after us and ask queries. There's also a lot of other registered for certain industries. Uh, there's a register for if you hire out employees working in Norway, there's a particular register for that. And there are registers for certain approvals. If you handle explosive, if you 
if you do electrical work uh, for restaurants to register for serving uh, alcohol and so on. In this case, when we presume that the foreign employer will actually assign employees to work in Norway, there are certain registers of foreign employees as well. And this is actually a tax register. It's called the assignment and employee register. Um, and the purpose of these registers is that the tax office should know, they, they will actually uh, see you, see all foreign enterprises or employees that come to work to Norway. And the reason the, how this is done is that your principal is obliged to report the contract with the foreign contractor. There's a certain form called RF 1199. And then the foreign contractor is obliged to report every foreign employee working in the contract on the form RF 1198. Uh, this is done electronically, but you can also file this on paper. And the whole issue here is that, as you see, there's no way you can hide from being uh, being uh, observed by the tax office in Norway. And there are, of course, fines for non-compliance here as well. Well, now we go on and let's say that the foreign employer has employees in Norway, they pay salary in for the work performed in Norway. Then the employer has a uh, salary withholding tax obligation. Uh, on every salary payment, the employer should deduct the withholding tax. The rate for the withholding tax is stated on the tax card for each employee. And if the employee has not such card, the withholding tax is 50%. You should note that the withholding tax is only a preliminary tax. And the final tax is made after the tax office has handled the tax return in most cases. Now, when the um, employer has withhold tax, it, the, the, the amount of withhold tax should be inserted on a particular withholding tax account in Norwegian Bank. There are other alternatives to this as well, but that is the obligation according to law. Next thing is that um, reporting of the salary should be made to the authorities. And for this purpose, we a couple of years ago, now introduced the so-called R melding innovation or A report. Uh, and this has to be filed at Altin. Um, it's done every month in the beginning of the month after the salary was paid. Uh, and the reporting should cover the salary or the cash salary, fringe benefits, salary with home tax, private pension plans, etc. etc. So the, 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 the tax office will on a monthly basis receive information of all the all the remuneration the employee receives from working in Norway. Of course, the employer then has collected the widow tax and has to pay it uh, to the authorities. That is done every second month and the pay instructions is obtained in the A report. Now, at the same time, with the paying of the Wieland tax, the employer must also pay the Social Security contribution, which is 14.1% of the gross salary. And the, the same deadlines, and you get the same pay instructions as you do for the Wieland tax in the A report. Now, the foreign employer will also have regular compliance issues as other Norwegian companies, such as bookkeeping according to Norwegian GAP, General Applicable Accounting Principles. Um, it will have to appoint an auditor if the turnover in the prior year in Norway exceeded not 6 million. And it will have to file annual financial accounts to the register of accounts another of these registers. And the due date here is normally within the end of July. This has to be filed electronically at Altin. And finally, as item number seven, the foreign company is obliged to file a corporate tax return. And this is actually irrespective whether uh, the foreign company claims that it should not be a subject tax according to a tax treaty between Norway and the 
home country of the foreign entity. And what you do then is you file a tax return and you argue in the tax return that you are exempted. Due date for this is in May in the year after the end of the accounting year. Um, and this has to be filed electronically at Altim. One issue is that uh, if you have appointed an auditor in Norway, the auditor is obliged to co-sign the tax return. And that in normally, normally creates some additional work compared to what uh, the foreign companies experience in other countries. All right. Part two of my presentation is about the foreign employee or the expats and, um, and, and their compliance obligations. First, they have to register in Norway. Um, and the reason here is to obtain a Norwegian ID number. It's called a need D number for foreigners and for people permanent residing in Norway, it's the F number. It's the 11, 11 digits number and it's used in all communications with the authorities and probably in, in certain of your contracts, like the lease contract of, of your apartment, in your contract with the employer and so on. The foreign employee has to undergo a physical ID control at the qualified tax office. There are for the three other tax offices that you can do this ID control with. Uh, you make an only online appointment and for meeting in person, bring with pass password, passport, you um, need uh, to bring with you a work contract or a statement from the employee that you actually have a job in Norway. And you should also bring with you a widow tax card application form in order to get the tax card for the widow tax. Now, coming on taxation, because the question many foreigners will, will ask is, do I have to pay tax in Norway? And in such case, how much? And the answer is quite blunt. If you work in Norway, yes, you're subject to Norwegian tax. That's based on Norwegian, Norwegian law. Work one day in Norway, and you actually basically subject to pay Norwegian tax. There are exemptions, because Norway has entered into around 90 tax treaties um, and if you if you are covered by one of these you can potentially claim the 183 days rule which in article normally article 15 of tax treaty says that if you know less than 183 days during a 12-month period and you're employed by the foreign employer without tax liability in Norway and you not hire out employee, then you can claim that you are tax uh, free in Norway. Um, you should know that in the tax treaty, you know, tax treaty has uh, various other articles about certain uh, positions, such as if you are a member of the board in the Norwegian company, uh, if you're an artist, and also most important, if you are working offshore Norway on the oil and gas at the continental shelf, there are different rules. Uh, for offshore worker, there's a threshold for 30 days before they become subject to Norwegian tax. With respect to how much tax you will have to pay if you are subject to tax, we have two alternative tax regimes for expats. And these are A, the regular tax regime, which I am subject to, and then some years ago we introduced a pay as you earn tax regime or payee tax regime for expats. And I'll expand on these two regimes. First, the uh, regular tax regimes. That consists of two elements. One, the first one is the net tax, which is 22% of ordinary income, which could be defined as the net income. It's a net income tax because the ordinary income is the gross income less deductible expenses, such as, for instance, uh, interest uh, expenses and standardized deductions. The, step, the second tax is the step tax, um, which is based only, is levied only on salary and it's levied on the gross salary without any deduction. Here are the different steps, which shows that this tax is actually a progressive tax 
the more you earn, the more you pay in taxes. And uh, step four, this, I guess for many of you, the step three will be interesting. It hits you if you have more than 650,000 knock in salary. And step four, if you have more than 1 million, you're at the highest level. What's important to note is that certain fringe benefits to expats are accepted tax-free in this regular tax regime. And the important here for expats coming to know working for a short period of time is that the free accommodation and free traveling are tax-free. Okay, the other tax regime for expats is the pay-as-you-earn or payee tax regime. The tax rate is quite low. It's a flat final tax of 16.8%, which is then withheld by the employer. And then the employer, no, the, excuse me, the employee is not required to file a tax return. Now, on top of the 16.8 is the social security tax, if that is relevant. I'll come back to that. So, but between the social security tax or contribution is due, the, the flat tax is 25%. Now, the truth is that this 16.8% has not been a big success. It was introduced a couple of years ago. And the reason is that there's a certain limit to when to qualify. Because in order to be served this regime, you cannot be a tax resident in Norway. Uh, you cannot work offshore in the oil and gas industry, and your salary has to be below the 651,000, the threshold number three in the step tax. That sort of rules out a lot of people from being eligible for this tax. In addition, and quite important, what we experienced that uh, many employees choose not to because the value of free accommodation and free traveling is included in the payee tax base. And that can be quite high amount. So before you, or lead to quite high taxes actually, so before you decide on which of two tax regimes the expert should elect, you need to do your homework. You, need, you should compare the FD tax rate in the two regimes. And in many, many cases, you'd find that the ordinary tax regime is actually a lower effective tax. Now, everybody working in Norway has to file a tax return, and that's super important. Um, this applies also if you believe or you have the opinion that you should not pay tax because you are exempted from a tax treaty. Uh, then you file a tax return and you explain why you not serve the tax. If you don't file a tax return, you will actually be served a tax on the amount that has been reported by the employee, or by the employer on the A report. The due date is within end of April in the year after the calendar year, and you can find this on paper or electronically then on the Altin. The final tax is based on the tax assessment. And as I went through the widow tax, you know, that is just a preliminary tax. So your employer has paid in amounts on, on your behalf to tax office. And then based on tax assessment, you will see if I have to pay more or if I should receive a return from a refund from the tax office. If the widow tax exceeds the final tax, you will receive refund. And if the widow tax is not sufficiently covered final tax, you must pay an addition. You should note that the addition is normally subject to an interest charge, but you can you can skip this by paying voluntary within end of May in, in the year after income year. Well, the exemption from this is, as I mentioned, if you have if you have been subject to and accept the PSU earn tax, then you're not required to file the tax return. But if you believe that that is not advantage for you, you must file a regular tax return. I've been so sort of briefly mentioning that you can become a tax resident in Norway. And if you do, you will have further obligation, further tax liabilities. So the first question is, when do I become a tax resident in Norway? 
And there are two alternative rules. One is if you're here more than 183 days during any 12 month period. And the other one is if you are more than 20, 270 days in any 36 month period. Now, the 270 days is because deemed that it's 90 days at average in a three year period. So if you if your stay in Norway um, is more than the 27 or reach the 27 days, you become so taxed the, day, the year you met the threshold. And what happens? Well, basically, according to Norwegian law, you are subject to income tax on worldwide income. And Norway also have the still have the net wealth tax which then will become live bill to on also on a worldwide net wealth. By the way, the net wealth tax is a tax on uh, you have to determine on your net value at the end of the year, the 31st of December, and the rate is 0.85% of your net value exceeding 1.5 million NOC. Now there are certain exemptions in tax treaties, so you have to carefully look if you call by that. I think the most important thing is that if you're Serbia, if you are still resident in your home country, uh, many of the Norwegian taxes, except the uh, salary tax, you should be relieved from. Because the tax treaty overrules Norwegian law and gives exemption. Well, finally, I'd like to say a few words on the social security. It is so that to be a member of the Norwegian social security system is for most people regarded as being an advantage since the memberships gives a lot of benefits if you become sick, if you become unemployed, um, and actually also quite a good pension regime if you are a permanent resident in Norway. Uh, and as you probably know, the Norway has put a lot of money in the Norwegian sovereign fund, uh, the oil fund, and I think Today, presently, we have like 11,000 billion NOC uh, at the, um, the fund, which is sort of like 2 million for each Norwegian. Um, and the basic rule here is, is that all employees working in Norway are members of the Norwegian Social Security system. And then, if you have benefit, you have to pay. And the pay is then what we call the social security contribution based on gross salary. The employee rate is 8.2%, which then is included in the middle on tax, as I mentioned, whereas the employer rate is normally 14.1%. Um, and the exemption is sort of interesting, and that is because the expats normally will not be entitled to like, the high pension from Norway if they're only here for a limited number of years. You should look into your the social security agreement with your home country, or or if you rest in the EU, there are the the social security agreement uh, with the EA, which gives in many cases exemption if you only assign to Norway for a short short period of time. Um, and how to achieve this exemption then is to go to your local social security office and get the certificate that you're covered by the home country system. That's the, called the A1 form in the EU. And this A form then has to be submitted to the Norwegian Social Security authorities called NAV, and then you, you will get the exemption in Norway. Super. I think that was all I had to my presentation today. Thank you for the attention. And I will now pass the floor to my dear colleague, Mr. Erik Engman. Okay, Erik, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Thank you Martin. Martin. Is my present presentation visible? Yes, yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is uh, Erik England. I'm uh, one of the lawyers in uh, Magnus Legal. I will now talk about uh, employment law in Norway. And I will focus on the most uh, uh, where in Norwegian employment law uh, differ a little bit uh, on some some parts uh, a lot from uh, other countries. Um, 
we have a, a the Norwegian employment law is uh, principally governed by the Working Environment Act. The um, the Working Environment Act uh, provides minimum rights, which uh, cannot, as a principal rule, be derogated from in disfavor for the employee. So it's a, a little bit uh, different from many other countries where you have, uh, if you agree to something, uh, even if it's not in favor of the employee, uh, then it's uh, the agreement that's, uh, that gives uh, that's uh, pr prioritized, but in Norway, it's the law. Um, so um, the, the agreement with the employee will, in that case, be in, not be valid. Um, and uh, historically, Norway has had strong unions, and uh, the unions have been working closely with the authorities and also with the uh, leading politi politicians. So we have strong protection of the employees, and uh, permanent employment is the main rule. So uh, temporary employment, that's uh, only allowed if you are a substitute for another, if there is uh, work that the company is not normally doing, and uh, for a limited uh, period of uh, 12 months in certain, which, under certain conditions. And it's a strong uh, protection against unfair dismissal in Norway. And uh, you have to have a, lot of um, preparations before you dismiss uh, an employee and, um, and a special uh, part of the Norwegian employment law is the right to remain in position. So the employer has to pay a full salary until the dispute is settled uh, finally in court. And um, if, this, uh, if the court case even if is appealed, the employee has the right to remain in position with full salary. Uh, for, um, until it, the case is treated in uh, in the appeal court, that may be uh, up to uh, in the worst case uh, a year or two after the termination. So, in in the, such cases, sometimes the uh, employee employers feel that they are uh, held hostage with uh, in this uh, this um, such cases. <clears throat> Another thing, we, in Norway, you must have a written contract, employment contract, uh, with all employees. There are no exceptions to this rule. If there is uh, no written contract, the employer has to prove what was, uh, what was uh, agreed. And uh, if you cannot prove what was agreed, then it's uh, the employee's statement that is uh, that's, uh, correct. And as, I, and as I referred to, if an employment contract contains conditions which are contrary to the provisions of the law or regulation, the agreement will not be valid in these areas, even if it's signed voluntarily by the employee. I will talk about, uh, for example, uh, overtime or, and uh, holiday pay. Uh, if you agree that uh, overtime is uh, included in the salary, that will not be a valid contract in Norway. Uh, same with holiday pay. If you agree that uh, all holiday pay will be paid out in January or together with a monthly salary, it will not be, be valid. And another thing is uh, at will contracts, which is uh, common in, uh, in some countries. It is not valid in Norway. And um, the, the rules for working hours and overtime in Norway is also quite uh, quite strict. Uh, there are more details than uh, what I will uh, present here, but uh, overtime pay is mandatory for all employees, except for uh, employees in leading positions. And leading positions, that means that you must have someone to, uh, someone under you in the, in the company, which you can tell to work instead of you. So you, you have to actually have some employees under you in the, which you have authority to, to tell to work. Uh, the other part is uh, particularly independent positions. That's uh, a little, that's uh, employees that can, for, for most of the part, decide their own, their own work hours. They decide 
when and how to do the work. Um, so that they, they will be accepted from the overtime rule. But uh, on the other hand, employee, employers will be reluctant to, to enter such a contract clause because uh, the, the downside to it will be that if, you, if the employee does not uh, attend from uh, eight to four or uh, the normal work hours, you, you cannot uh, take any action against that because the definition of the position is uh, particularly independent. So that's why a lot of employers are uh, reluctant to sign these clauses in Norway. And then the um, consequence is that they will have the right to overtime pay. And overtime pay is, um, is for work more than nine hours a day or 40 hours a week. There's our uh, shorter weeks for um, work underground and uh, there can be uh, special agreements uh, for work offshore and we have also a possibility to make an agreement to to calculate the work hours uh, for a fixed average um, so there are some some alternatives but in general over time will be more than nine hours on one day or 40 hours in one week and the extra pay for overtime is minimum 40%. Uh, some collective agreements uh, have higher percentage and uh, other rules with shorter days and uh, shorter weeks, but um, the law states the minimum and has 40%. And it's not only uh, different percentage for uh, weekends or uh, holidays or such thing, it's uh, in the law, it's 40%. In Norway, we have a possible possibility to have trial period, and that's, uh, that's very common to have the first six months in Norway. And during the trial period, it's uh, the notice period, can be uh, 14 days, which is normal. So it's quite short notice period. Um, but a little bit different uh, in Norway than other countries, even our neighbor, close neighbor countries. It's a, a termination during trial period. You must have a justified cause. And then you must uh, be able to prove that the employee has had a fair chance to succeed in his work. You also need to document uh, that you have given proper, uh, adequate training. And uh, so it's not a trial period, it's not, uh, not uh, only a period that the employee can show what his, uh, show his performance, but uh, he has a, a lot of protection anyway. Uh, an important thing with the trial period is that uh, the employee is not in, entitled to automatically remain in position if he's terminated and disputes the termination. So it's, um, in that case, it's uh, important to have a trial period. But as I said, you must have justified cause and the employee, employer must prove that the employee has had a fair chance and uh, proper feedback. So he had the chance to, to, to better his performance. And it's uh, in general in uh, Norwegian employment law, we have a lot of uh, employment cases, uh, termination cases in the Norwegian court. Um, and uh, and the, the law is quite uh, general, but uh, in practice, it's uh, a lot of cases where the employees dispute the terminations. So it's important uh, to do good preparation work before you before any term, termination. And there's a, it's not a, any statutory re requirement for employers to ha give a formal warning before uh, dismissal or summary dismissal, but it's, um, it's considered to, to strengthen the case of the employer if you have uh, been giving a clear warning and that uh, you have told the employee in clear words what uh, is, is expected from the, from the employee. So it's um, the um, requirements, it's uh, important to have a solid and just case for the termination. 
and there is no at will employment, as I said, so the employer must prove just grounds for the termination. And uh, in general, downsizing can be uh, is just ground for termination. But it has to be carried out with a strict focus on equal and on an objective selection. So it's uh, important to have an objective process and make the decision in the correct uh, places in the company, maybe as a, in a board decision that we need to downsize the company. And, and may, some may be re redundant. And if there are terminations related to the employee, the results from the employee must be substandard and uh, they must have been showing neglect or lack of loyalty to such an extent that it's objectively clear that the employment must be terminated. And, he, and the employee must be made aware that he is below standard and that uh, he has a fair chance to change his ways and is uh, better his performance. So it should not come as a, a surprise to the employee that he is uh, terminated. <clears throat> and uh, there's also uh, some special protection against dismissals in Norway. It's um, first is uh, the first 12 months of illness, absence from work because you're sick. Uh, uh, the um, absence from uh, due to illness cannot be uh, used as a reason for uh, for dismissal in the first 12 months after. Uh, the employee is uh, incap incapacitated for the work. And the same goes for, um, for um, cases of maternal or paternity leave, that uh, if you are pregnant or you have uh, childbirth or adoption, it's um, not, uh, the employee is protected against dismissal. And uh, yeah, other cases, uh, other, uh, other reasons can be valid if you, uh, for example, you are uh, in a process of downsizing and you are uh, on the list uh, for redundancy and you get sick after the process has started, then it's not the illness and the, or the absence that's the reason before the termination. But the uh, employer needs to prove that, has a um, burden of proof, that the um, dismissal is not due to the illness, illness but for the redundancy situation. It's also important that you, before uh, making the final decision to dismiss the employee, employee you must have consultations. And the uh, employee must be um, invited to a meeting and is, um, he needs to be informed that he has a right to bring a representative to this discussion meeting. And the discussion meeting is obligatory both in redundancy situations and when the employee is dismissed for other reasons. So, <clears throat> and so before you make the final decision, you must uh, have the discussion meeting and it should be made a protocol from the discussion meeting. And then after that, it can be presented with a termination or notice letter. Uh, after he received the notice letter, the employee will have a right to demand negotiations. In that, uh, at that point in time, it's uh, very common that the employee is represented with a lawyer. <clears throat> and then the employer must uh, invite the employee to the um, negotiation meeting within two weeks. And if the um, employee then disputes the dis dismissal, he has, as I mentioned earlier, the right to remain in position until the case is settled. The <clears throat> last minutes, there's uh, a couple of uh, special rules in Norway. Uh, the rules regarding holiday pay. It's, uh, we find the rules in the Holiday Act. And the special uh, thing in Norway is we don't, in general, have paid vacation. The employees are not entitled to ordinary salary during holiday abs absence. So the, um, the employee earn 10.2 or 12% uh, holiday pay the year before the vacation. So normally in Norway, the first year you start, you do not get any paid vacation. 
because you have to earn the vacation pay the year before. The minimum holiday pay rate in Norway is 10.2%, and that uh, represents four weeks and one day vacation. But most employees in Norway have agreed a holiday pay rate of 12% of the salary, and has an agreement of five weeks vacation. The last is uh, the most common uh, agreement in Norway. And the holiday pay is, um, according to the law, it should be paid last ordinary payday before the holiday and no later than one week prior to the employee's vacation. For employees on a fixed monthly salary, it's normal that all holiday pay is paid, for example, in June and, and um, salary for all vacation for a whole year is uh, deducted from the salary in the same month. A little bit uh, at last, uh, a little bit of about social security in Norway. Uh, one important thing is uh, social security in Norway is only for members of the Norwegian social security. That means that if you present an A1, you are not member and not entitled to payments from the Norwegian social security. For sick pay in Norway, uh, we have full uh, pay during sickness in Norway up to and salary of Norwegian uh, 600,000 NOx. And it's, um, you have to work four weeks before you are entitled to sick pay. Uh, parental leave, we have 80 or 100% pay uh, during parental leave. And uh, both parents must be members of Norwegian Social Security to be under full coverage. That was a, a brief uh, overview over some important things regarding the employment law in Norway and rights for the employees and the obligations for the employers. Um, our time is now uh, one minute past the 10. We will uh, thank you for the uh, attention. And uh, as you can see on the last uh, last uh, picture here we have our um, our names and our email addresses and our phone numbers so please do not hesitate to contact us if you have any questions or need any more information after this uh, presentation all presentations will be sent to the attendees so um, and all the, the one of you has uh, raised the questions in the chat will be replied to later. So thank you and bye-bye.